Good afternoon, and welcome to the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council's program featuring guest speaker, Dr. Melissa Tully. Thanks to Dr. Tully and to everyone who has joined us in person at Midwest One Bank and online. I am Brett Cloyd. I'm the social science and public policy librarian and also Fulbright librarian at the University of Iowa. I'm also a board member of the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council and chair of the communications committee. ICFRC wants to acknowledge and thank its annual donors, members, sponsors, and partners for their support. The list includes the Iowa Arts Council through the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs, Humanities Iowa and the National Endowment for the Humanities, the University of Iowa's International Program, Honors Program, and Public Policy Center, the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization, Midwest One Bank, Taxes Plus, and City Channel 4 for providing online access to the ICFRC's programs along with the UI Library's archives. ICFRC has adopted the Native American Land Acknowledgement prepared for the City of Iowa City's Ad Hoc Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the Human Rights Commission. We recognize that our home community of Iowa City now occupies the homelands of Native American nations to whom we owe our community sorry, owe our commitment and dedication. The full text of our acknowledgement is available on our website, icfrc.org. I would now like to introduce Dr. Melissa Tully. Dr. Tully is the Interim Director, School of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of Iowa. She is also an Associate Professor and Easton Professor of Research. She studies news literacy, misinformation, global media, with a particular focus on African media studies and engagement. She has a particular interest in media produced in and about Africa and has conducted research in multiple sub-Saharan African countries. She is currently working on research about misinformation and news in Kenya and Senegal. She teaches courses that focus on social and digital media for both undergraduate and graduate students. She is also the director of the Global Media Studies Working Group at the Oberman Center and a senior research fellow in the Public Policy Center at the University of Iowa. She received her PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2011. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tully, who will talk about misinformation in Sub-Saharan Africa. Thank you. Excellent, thank you so much. So I'm excited to uh, join you today to talk a little bit about um, election misinformation with a particular focus on Kenya, although I will talk about um, Nigeria and, and Senegal a little, a little bit. So just to um, give you a quick overview, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some earlier elections um, in the past uh, two decades um, in Kenya, but just really briefly. And then I wanna uh, uh, give you a bit more about the 2017 election and particularly the Cambridge Analytica scandal, um, which you may have heard about both in um, the United States and other contexts, but I really wanna focus on what it tells us about uh, foreign interference in elections and what it tells us about sort of online actors and the way they engage in elections around the world. And then I wanna pivot a little bit to talk about two um, issues that to me are fundamental to understanding elections and election misinformation. So one of the things that I focus on is misinformation in news and information outside of election context and outside of sort of crises, kind of the what I call the everyday. And of course, we can't um, not mention COVID misinformation because it plays a huge role in kind of how people um, have changed their understandings of institutions and trust in institutions and just the general uncertainty around news and information. And then I'll briefly talk about what the 2022 election in Kenya um, has shown us in, in as we know, we are in election season here as well, and just kind of thinking about the global connections and, and crossovers um, across countries. So my research in, um, in Kenya and in Kenyan elections really goes back to the 2007 election. And uh, this election saw um, 
a few really troublesome things that occurred, including post-election violence that um, was was pretty widespread in Kenya. But it also saw, from a communication and media standpoint, the rise of a of a platform called Ushahidi. And at the time, if you can take yourself back to 2007. There was not a lot of um, social media um, activity, even in the United States, but even less in um, in Kenya. There was an active blogging scene. And so Kenyan bloggers and other folks who were really online, kind of these online personalities, started this website called Ushahidi. And really what it was about was collecting information from communities using text messages and then crowdsourcing that information to try to combat election rumors. And they created a map around these um, this information. And at the time, I was a graduate student, and I was uh, doing research in, an, in Kenya, and I was just following these bloggers and had the, the joy of watching this, um, this project develop. And so I really got involved in, invested in understanding uh, rumors as as we used to call them, now we call it misinformation. <laughs> but we, we, there was a, there's a whole literature on rumors that I won't get into. And looking at these ideas of how citizens can contribute to the information space, both as, um, unfortunately, as the creators and disseminators of rumors and misinformation, but also as c- combatants and how they fight against misinformation. And that really sets the stage for a lot of the research that I continue to do today. Um, in the in the following years, I continued to stay invested in Kenya and Kenyan elections and information space. And I looked at in the post election period, so following the 2007 election, um, looked at efforts to um, reconcile communities that were were um, engaged in in um, you know, violence against them. Um, a lot of this was political violence. And so I did work on media interventions in and around Kenya. And really the lead up to the 2013 presidential election was really about this idea of unity and bringing Kenya back together and thinking about how um, media could play a role there. And so I, I did work on um, telev- the use of television and social media campaigns uh, to promote this unified Kenya, this sort of vision of one Kenya that could um, push back on these ethnic and political tensions that had really underscored Kenyan elections um, historically and in the in the multi-party era. And one of the goals of, of this research was really to look at the periods between elections and then the election itself, and then kind of what happened. So a lot of the work that I have become interested in over time is that in between. What happens when not all eyes are focused on um, on various countries? Because a lot of times, particularly with research in um, the global south, we tend to only focus on big major events like elections or other crises, you know, natural disasters, pandemics. And so what happens in the between times? And so I'll talk more about that. But before I do, I think the 2017 election um, in, in, in Kenya is really pivotal, pivotal to understand the current landscape and for us to understand global elections. So 2016 in the United States is obviously a turning point for how we think about um, misinformation around elections. But this kind of work and um, um, nefarious actors engaging in, in information creation and dissemination is a global problem that precedes um, the 2016 election in the United States. And this research on, on, um, on Kenya really focuses in on this Cambridge Analytica scandal. And I'm just going to go through it really briefly because really the, the specifics of this organization aren't actually what's important. Um, and in fact, a lot of what they said they were doing or could do was actually overstated and overblown. But what it shows is the way that these, um, these non-state actors engage in uh, a disinformation campaigns. So just a brief um, background on what Cambridge Analytica was. It was a political consulting firm. You can see it launches in 2013. So it's right in this time, right, the late, the late 2010s, where we're starting to see um, 
a lot of interest in data and analytics and using social media as a way to understand the electorate. And so they are really advertising themselves as this um, this company that can tell you who to target, right? Micro-targeting, all of these things that you've probably heard and doing so in a way that was supposed to be so much better than traditional models. But as I noted, actually a lot of that was oversold and they weren't actually really able to do all they said they could do, but it doesn't discount the fact that they did access our personal data in ways that was, um, in some countries, illegal, but also I think we could all agree unethical. So they were really mostly known, uh, particularly in this country, for working for the Republican Party. Uh, they worked for Ted Cruz. Then they worked for Donald Trump. Uh, they were also really big in the Brexit campaign in Britain. So in, in the United States and in the Western world, these are the elections and the times that get a lot of attention. In 2018, there was a couple of investigations um, by major world media outlets that showed um, the sort of dark side of, of uh, this group. And people knew a little bit about what they were all about and kind of the shady dealings. But this, these investigations, which used undercover footage and other things, really showed the kinds of behaviors that folks in this firm were, um, were engaging in. And what this, um, this work revealed was they had their, their sort of tentacles around elections, global elections, that no one had really been thinking that much about, in part because they weren't major players in the, in the kind of global, global space, if you think about you know, major world powers. So most of the attention, as I had said, was focused on Trump and Brexit. But this, um, this investigation and then later work really revealed how, how this company had been working in much smaller countries around the world, and two of those being Nigeria and Kenya, which in the African context are large, powerful um, countries. And so you can see that what they're doing here and what we, what we talk about in this paper um, is really testing out these um, strategies and these ways of, of getting into the information space in places where they thought maybe folks wouldn't look. And so the work that my colleague and I did uh, really looks at, at the um, campaigns in um, in Kenya, in Nigeria, and what we what we look at here, and one of the reasons this is super interesting, is in this um, in the news reports. You can see a couple screenshots here. The uh, folks from Cambridge Analytica talk about their work in Kenya. They are very explicit about working on on these campaigns, and you can see the quote there that they claim to run quote just about every element of his campaign. So although there's been um, back and forth on what actually Cambridge Analytica did, what we know is that they were involved in these, in these elections. And so what, um, what we looked at around um, this um, interaction was how the media actually covered Cambridge Analytica in Nigeria and Kenya to understand what were the core issues. Because as I said, to us, Cambridge Analytica itself is going to come and go. But the core issues that emerged, uh, we thought were really important in how they've actually played out in subsequent years. So a couple of core issues that emerge from um, the media coverage, these ideas around data privacy and protection. This becomes a much larger um, issue globally around 2016, 2017, 2018. And so you can see that this, um, this expose, these exposés really contributed to that. We hear a lot more about unethical campaigning on social media, what companies and, and um, candidates are doing in framing it in ethical terms as, as being really quite, um, quite morally dubious, to say the least. And the thing that I find most relevant and most important for the, the Kenyan context and the Nigerian context is this idea of foreign involvement in elections. Of course, we've seen that in the United States as well, right, around Russia and these other questions. This is happening globally. And how, does, how do we think about this when we're talking about emerging democracies, right? We are talking about countries that have had you know, five, 10, quote unquote, successful elections, not democracies that have been longstanding. And we've even seen our own longstanding democracy face a lot of challenges. And so what we did, and I'm not going to get into the methods here because it, it, it's not super relevant, but um, Brian Ekdell and I, we, we did some research on how the media in Kenya and Nigeria now covered these issues. What did they make of this global problem that was also a local problem? And how did they dig into what it meant for their, for their countries? And so just to give you a sense of, of how, um, how this played out. So Cambridge Analytica was already known in Kenya. So there was some work being done about it before these large exposés, 17 articles in our data set. 
But after the, um, and you can see there's some things here about scary times and what does this all mean, but after that March 2018, it really blows up. And you can see some of the language that's being used here about um, how they're targeting this propaganda, uh, they're blaming the, the use of data mining and all of this kind of stuff. So this language is really getting into the media space and folks are really starting to think about what, what this means. What does this mean for our social media where we were thinking about social media as a quote unquote democratic space? What if it's just being co-opted and we're being manipulated in these spaces, which we've seen um, in many contexts to, to be true. So after that documentary and after all of that work um, uh, comes out, you can start to see these, these discussions about local reactions, local context. How does this matter for our democracy? And you start to see these conversations around undermining democracy and what this means for both um, the current elections in, in Kenya and in Nigeria as well, but also what does this mean globally if these kinds of companies can just operate in the shadows? And just a couple examples then, to, so you can see what the coverage looked like. Um, so this is um, from the Daily Nation, which is a Kenyan newspaper. You know, kind of just just talking about needing um, better laws to actually protect people. Right? We need to get data protection laws. All of these things that either didn't exist or were very um, nascent. They were. They didn't have a lot there. You can see here again. What does this mean for for our elections? What what can we what can we kind of do going forward? You can see here who believes these lies. What what are these? What are all of these? Um, this this content and these videos that they're talking about were quite um, quite well known. So this was content that really did circulate heavily on um, in, in Kenyan social media spaces. Couple other things, right? What look at this? These companies irresponsible, stoking those uh, ethnic tensions that I talked about, right? So if we think 2007 to 2013, really working on unity and not having elections be so ethnically um, oriented, and then in these ads, and I'm not going to show you them today, the um, the use of just really, really. Not, not great, <laughs> really bad language around ethnic differences and, and stoking those tensions that have been um, underscoring political uh, life in Kenya. So you can kind of see how this is, this is playing out. And so what happens? So in 2019, there is a bill passed. So the, Kenya passes a data protection bill, and it starts to focus on those ideas around protecting um, protecting our personal data from these firms. So not letting these firms access our Facebook data, Twitter data, whatever it is. That's important, and I, that is an issue that I think we need to spend a lot of time talking about and, and digesting. But more importantly to this conversation, to me, is the way that these foreign firms and these individuals use these African elections as proxy battles, or as we call them as experiments, as testing grounds, to do these techniques, to try these techniques out, that then we saw go up to the UK, come up to the United States. In many, many elections, we've seen this playbook. And so when you look globally at what misinformation and disinformation looks like, it shouldn't be too surprising that it tends to have a similar flavor. Whatever your country's main cleavages are, we're gonna stoke those. <laughs> Whatever you're afraid of in a candidate, we're going to play that up. Wherever your, your fears are, right? It's a very fear-based model. And what social media has allowed and what these companies have shown is that foreign actors with very little, um, they don't care about these countries in many ways, they are able to get in and sway, and sway elections. And there was some talk about thinking about this through in what we did in the paper, some post-colonial um, language as well, and just really thinking about the lack of care and just complete disregard for, um, for countries, uh, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa and parts of Southeast Asia, where they could just mess around and do this kind of stuff. And then we've seen how that's then played out in other, other countries. So that's an election context that, a misinformation context that stays with us, right? It doesn't just go away when elections end. And I think that's really important, is that the, the environment that is created or bolstered stays. And so then what happens after? And so the research that a lot of the research that I'm doing now is around that time, right? As I was saying, the sort of the mundane, the banal, the everyday. What happens when there's no election? And 
some of this work um, has really been about just understanding this, this question. What are people's experiences? If we don't understand individual experiences, it's really difficult for us to both, um, from an academic perspective, like theoretically and conceptually, understand these problems. But from a practical perspective, it's also really hard to develop interventions, education, messaging, whatever it might be, that we might think if we, if we believe this is a problem, for example, how are we going to stop it? If we don't even understand the contours of the problem, we can never develop an effective solution. And so a lot of this work that I've been doing um, in the past few years, particularly starting around um, 2018, 2019, um, is really focused on this idea. And what, you, what I find in some of this work is really about, um, and this shouldn't be too surprising to most people, in the everyday, politics is not front and center for people, right? They're thinking about, as we all saw in this current election, they're thinking about cost of food, cost of fuel, unemployment. So the things that affect us every day. And so even in, in, a, in, in Kenya, which on, on a global scale is a pretty politically active and knowledgeable country, on a day-to-day -day basis, people are much more worried about what we would call like a scam or fraud. So they're not talking about, oh, quote unquote, fake news or, or fake political stories in the everyday. Most people are talking about things like, I saw this job posting and I sent it to my brother and it was actually a scam and they were trying to get us to pay, you know, a thousand shillings to, to be interviewed. And they're, they're seeing things going around in their WhatsApp groups about, um, and this is pre-COVID, remind you, so they're seeing things going around in their WhatsApp groups and their family groups about herbal cures for cancer, right? The same kinds of misinformation that we see come back in, in COVID. And so I'll talk about that um, as well. So this kind of content, this kind of news or false news and misinformation is really connected to lived experiences. However, when you get people talking about the broader context of their information ecosystem, if you will, it does come back to politics because they talk about, I, there's, we can't trust what we see on social media. Do you remember that, that video that showed ABC? Do you remember the way that the candidates were saying this, that, and the other thing? So the way that these big moments, these elections, inform the everyday is sort of it's just always there, right? It, it undermines trust in institutions. It undermines trust um, in all the kind of content that people are seeing, particularly on social media. And so in, in this research, uh, in this, this study that I have up here is based on focus groups um, that I did in Kenya in 2019. So again, post 2017 election, but not quite up to the 2022 that just happened and pre-COVID. So it's a world in which really, not that much is going on, which was kind of the point. And so um, in this work, one of the really interesting things that came out of it was in these discussions, um, the participants actually, I gave them content to engage with, political false content, health false content, things like that. Nobody really cared about the political content because it was like, meh, it's not, it's not what's bothering me right now. The health content people were really into, which then comes back, um, comes back later. So when we think about this kind of everyday and you can see in this paper, if I don't know if you can, you can see the abstract. A lot of what I was talking about here is what do people trust? Why do they trust it? Where are they getting their information? Who are they going to? And then what strategies do people employ to make decisions around information? Because a lot of my work is about news literacy or um, tactics and strategies that we have for navigating this mess. <laughs> we live in a mess, so what can we do um, to navigate it? And so that's part of this, this research as well, is what do people do? And in part, the reason I'm interested in that is to get back to what I was talking about earlier, where it's developing educational um, interventions and other messaging to help people make sense of the mess. And so this work really is informing that kind of um, of research. So this, as I mentioned, was part of a, um, of a study in, in Kenya, and it was also part of a larger um, um, cross-African study where we did focus groups in six African countries. We had um, 
participants from urban communities, rural communities, higher ed, um, all over the place. And we have more research. I'm not going to talk about it today um, across the six across the six countries, which really looks at both how audiences perceive themselves in their role in this ecosystem, this role in the mess. Right? Do they understand what, what the role they play and how do they think about it? But also the role of these other actors. So if you go back to the idea of these bad actors, well, who are the good actors or who are the potentially good actors and who should be addressing misinformation? And you see a lot of interesting things emerge around um, the role of governments, the role of laws, so talking about those kinds of laws, but it's quite nuanced and it's often really connected to this balance of free speech and all of these other questions, same questions that we grapple with um, in the United States. So if we take this kind of every day and we think about that, I think that this then helps us understand the spectacular. And what's more spectacular than a global pandemic, right? So when you start to understand the everyday, it helps you to understand these kinds of events, right? And so the research that, that I had been doing in Kenya, and of course, like everybody, I, it had um, the goal of that, <laughs> that work was to continue through to the 2022 Kenyan election with lots of field research planned, uh, going back to Kenya multiple times a year, none of which was able to happen after 2019 with, with the pandemic. But because we had already done this work and had this groundwork in place, my team and I and graduate students and, and other faculty were able to still address misinformation around COVID and do so in a way that was truly um, invested in understanding local conditions and really understanding what does COVID misinformation look like in Kenya and Senegal and these other countries, given what we know about what everyday misinformation looks like and what we know about elections. And then to go back to the other part of who cares, right? These countries are being underserved by everybody. So if we don't understand what's going on, this is, this is really a, a problem um, in, our, in our global space. And so what we did here, and this is part of a larger study where we actually did some experimental work testing some of those messages and interventions. Uh, I'm happy to talk about that um, after, but I left all the I left all the quantitative stuff out for today, so we just talk about uh, the qualitative. So we were actually able to, despite not being able to travel back, um, luckily we had um, existing connections with research firms and local researchers. Um, we were able to conduct 96 in-depth interviews with a range of folks. And if you recall, I said that work on looking at who's responsible for both the creation of misinformation but also stopping it, these are the kinds of folks that come up, and so we wanted to talk to them. So journalists and media professionals are often both blamed for spreading misinformation and then said, oh, but you guys also have to stop it. Same thing with government, right? Same thing with social media users. So we interviewed this range of folks. Um, and as you can see, this includes, this includes Senegal, um, in part to expand this work to Francophone Sub-Saharan Africa, where there's a lot less um, research. So um, English-speaking Sub-Saharan Africa has far more attention um, in the media, in the global media studies space, and even in African media studies. So we really wanted to get um, more attention paid to French-speaking uh, West Africa, and we had a team of folks who could, who could help us with that. And so we conducted these interviews in 2021. So now we are almost, actually we're a year into the pandemic. And so we've seen how misinformation flows, how it's addressed. And we've had a chance to really get a sense of what the content was that was out there. Uh, at the same time as we're doing this work, we're collecting social media posts on uh, WhatsApp, Facebook, all of these things. We can see the content, but we don't know if people are actually reading it, what they, what it, if they care, what they do with it. And so in, this, in these interviews, we really talk to folks about their news and information habits or their misinformation habits for some of them <laughs> who are consuming that. And we really leaned into this idea of who or what is responsible for spreading and stopping misinformation, these various actors. And we take a this kind of socio-technical approach to kind of understanding this mess, this ecosystem. There are human actors, there are machine actors, there are institutions and organizations, and they all have a role to play. So who do these folks think has the most and largest role to play? And we started looking at some of, the, some of these questions. And, and as I said, we're, we're actually still digging through this data now, but some of the work um, that, that we've, that we've um, conducted really talks about the interplay among these groups, 
journalists, governments, regular folks, and the role that they, they each have. So I'm going to show you just a, a, couple, of, a couple of quotes um, here to illustrate kind of this complexity. So you can see here, this is from, oh, and as I mentioned, so in Senegal, uh, we did do all these interviews um, in French or Wolof, but they've been translated to English um, for obviously the sake of, of talking about them today. But you can see here, a lot of this is about people don't know anything about journalism. They don't know how this works, right? We have to educate the public. We really have to work on reducing this problem. So this is an idea from, a, from an expert, right, kind of coming down. This is from a journalist in Senegal saying, if the public is well informed, then they can do the work. They can recognize the real and the fake, right? They can tell, they can differentiate. And they go on to say, you know, unfortunately, the public does not know how to tell the difference. They don't generally recognize who is a journalist, who isn't, who is an influencer, right? This is a very much a, um, a top-down view of, of audiences, and this is pretty common. We see this in the United States as well, right? Oh, if people just, if people just, well, people aren't. So we need to think more about our role in that. Right, so this idea, educate, learn, do all of this, right? Make, make sure you know um, uh, what you're engaging with. Think, you, you know, I like this, have a conscience before you do it. So this idea that people really need to take responsibility. This is coming from, from these um, journalists and these experts and other folks. And, and in this, this paper that we're, we're writing here, we are arguing that there's a, a notion or a view of an imagined audience, of what it should be, imagine if. Imagine if, right, everyone was so educated and spent all their time reading the news and differentiating fact from fiction and blah, blah, blah. That doesn't happen. And that doesn't mean people are dumb or not spending time, but it does mean that people have different ideas about what checking information means, what's of value to them. And so what we're seeing in these interviews is this disconnect between what professionals, experts, et cetera, think we should do and what we do. So regular folks, they do spend some time but you know what they spend time on? Those scams, that fraud, those health false claims, the things that affect them. They are not gonna spend time digging around to find out if really did the governor give five, you know, $5 million to this firm because his cousin was working there. They don't care. <laughs> they really don't. And that's what a lot of these journalists and fact checkers are spending their time on. That's a disconnect, right? And so you can see here this, this person from Senegal is talking about checking, talking about Googling, doing that. Okay, that, that's something. You can see here checking against comments, you know, doing this kind, of, this kind of work. That makes me cringe a little bit, right? Because to me, that's not where I want people to go. But I have to recognize if that's where they're going, then it's our job to meet them where they are, not to wish them to be. Here's a really good example of someone who actually, you know, does take some time. <laughs> like, if, some, if someone told me that they, they do this, this is actually quite a lot of time and effort that goes into this kind of information digging, right? So what do I do? Oh, I warn people. I do all of this. But what all of these quotes are really about is that kind of stuff that resonates with people, right? That kind of content that they feel affects them. And if we take it to the current political environment in the United States, this is the entire debate that we hear about with, you know, campaigns. Do we talk about democracy and the death of democracy, or do we talk about inflation? And if we always look at those things in conflict, we're always going to have these problems, because what do people want to talk about? Gas prices. What do Kenyans want to talk about? Unemployment. Scams. Lack of resources. And there's a real disconnect, and this really connects to the political environment when folks are just talking right past. And so a lot of what we've seen in, 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 um, in this research in, in Kenya, particularly, and, and a bit in Senegal, but um, again, my expertise is, is more in Kenya, is that people will take the time, they'll do the work, they'll think on it when it has real perceived impact, when they perceive it as important. And what we see is if we only look at elections or only look at global pandemics, we miss what's important to people. We miss the fact that people do have strategies and do have tactics that they employ if we only leveraged them when elections came, if we only worked on establishing trustworthy networks 
um, during the downtime, during the everyday, that could then be leveraged during the times of crisis, during the times of, of elections. And we know in this country and in, in many others, we don't do that. We don't do that hard work of the in-between. And so there, that's what makes then these, um, these big moments seem catastrophic in part because we didn't do the work. We didn't lay that groundwork. And so a lot of the current work that I'm doing is trying to understand that, trying to make sense of that mess, trying to look at these various actors, technical actors, human actors, all of the folks involved, to understand this broader landscape so that we can think, what do we do? Right? How do we, how do we prepare? How do we, as um, scholars and educators and, and just people who are civically minded, how do we actually participate in creating a, a better information ecosystem, um, a better um, opportunity for folks to actually engage with high quality content, right? The idea that, oh, if I just put it out there, they will come, no. And honestly, the systems are built against that, right? That's not what Twitter supports. That's not what Facebook supports if we think about those algorithms. So one of the things that I'm interested in now, and, and I think it goes back to that, you know, take your mind back to that 2017 Cambridge Analytica, these companies are expanding massively in sub-Saharan Africa and other parts of, um, of, of the world, in part because that's where, the new, that's where they see the next audience. That's where they see their next consumer base, right? They've tapped out. <laughs> Facebook's not growing in the United States, so they have to go find the people where the people are. So there's massive, massive um, expansion into a number of countries with absolutely no strategy for addressing misinformation. Think about what's going on right now in the United States. Twitter and Facebook are destroying their staff, and they're destroying their, they're, they're, they're laying people off left and right in the areas of integrity, misinformation, et cetera, and that's in the United States. So think about how little they care <laughs> about Kenya or Nigeria or, or, or India. They don't, they don't care. And so they're massively expanding um, into these spaces with no strategy, no local language experts, all of these things. And so that's really a, a, a huge problem. And so if we think about those social media companies as one of those actors, we have to understand kind of what they're up to. It's really challenging because they don't let us in, but trying to figure out ways to understand what they're up to. We have to keep working on developing and testing these interventions. So a lot of um, the, the experimental work that my, my team does and that we are interested in is really thinking about, okay, well, we have the mess. We have a small role to play. We got to get the most bang for our buck. What are the best kind of messages we can develop? What are the best kinds of trainings we can develop? Can we just nudge people a little to do something. And it's not gonna be, oh, send someone a, you know, a WhatsApp message and now all of a sudden you've changed their mind and now whatever, right? These are longer term um, strategies, but we did see, we ran an experiment in Kenya and in Senegal, a two week experiment using um, information around COVID. So back to that project where those interviews, those 96 interviews led to the development of this experiment. And we were able to nudge people around um, their views on vaccines and their views on who to trust. And so it's possible, <laughs> it is possible. Uh, it takes a lot of time and effort, uh, but if we can do it in this context, then we are much better off when we come to these elections and these other, these other times. <sighs> this bad actor problem. So if we think about Cambridge Analytica and those folks in this category of bad actors, these large scale bad actors, we saw this in the 2022 Kenyan election. And luckily, I think in part because Cambridge Analytica got so much attention, there was research on this before the election. There was an amazing um, report, and you can see I have the, the screenshot here, on um, research done by the Mozilla Foundation, the, the foundation that runs um, the Firefox web browser. They have, they're a nonprofit, but um, they did some really interesting work on these, um, these, what they call the shadowy world of disinformation, but essentially how folks were being paid, real people are being paid to put out false content, and they're doing it because the pay is good. Right, it, but they're being funded by these international and foreign um, foreign companies, and it's really hard to track because it's so right. It's so removed from the actual um, from the source, and so trying to understand that is super challenging because they are not the quote unquote bots. Right, bots are. It's pretty easy to do bot detection using AI and these other things. It's really hard <laughs> to detect when someone is just 
being paid to create false content. And so we could see this here, um, and you can you can you can read from the the subheads. Meanwhile, Twitter is doing little to curb this behavior, and good faith activists are having a hard time on the platform. I could cover the part that says inside the shattered world of Kenyan uh, misinformation and take out the word Kenyan, and you would think this was a quote about the United States. Again, this is two years ago in Kenya. Why are these actors and organizations doing this? It's a testing ground. It's the same stuff we see in our elections, but they're not stupid. They're not going to go in for the billion dollar play before they test it out on the small scale. So if we look at these global elections through this lens, we can see a lot of this behavior um, happening. And so we should be looking at these elections as examples of what can happen when these bad actors are just allowed to go rogue. And we should not be putting our faith in the tech companies because we're seeing this globally. So this is something that we have to keep looking at. We ha as researchers, we have to be committed to investigating this, these complex phenomena. Uh, the other thing that I think we need to be doing and we're doing more of, um, in, in particularly um, around political information, but again, in that, in that everyday space, we have to understand the offline and the small group or the closed group interaction. So one way we do this um, is through talking to people, <laughs> but also trying to understand spaces like WhatsApp groups, which are technically online, but they're closed groups, right? You, if you've used WhatsApp, you know it's not like social media. It's you having a conversation with 10, 15 people and trying to understand what happens in those spaces. And there's been an increased um, effort to do that, which is really exciting and, because it's a challenge. You can't just get access to the data, right? It's like if someone asks you to look at your messages. What? So trying to get into those spaces has been a, has been, um, a big um, focus for media and communication scholars, and we're seeing some really interesting and good work coming out around that. What do people do in these groups? Why do they do it? How do they share? Do they, one of the areas that I'm interested in, do people correct misinformation in a closed group? The answer is sometimes. <laughs> and again, it depends on what it's about and who said it. Um, in the Kenyan context, for example, it's, it's harder for young people to correct their elders in, a, in these environments because that's culturally not seen as appropriate. And so what do people do? Well, they might have it then take that conversation off the group chat, do it in person, or send them an individual message. How can we know that without really digging in and talking to people? We have to work with the public. Um, I do not like to, to put all the pressure on us and the people, but I want to think about the public as, and this is why I'm interested in news literacy and interventions and whatever, we're in that ecosystem, right? So what kind of agency can we have? What can we do with the mess? And how can we actually fight for making it better and less messy, you know, fighting for um, regulation or whatever you might believe to be the case, but also... There are small things we can do. We cannot share misinformation, for one. And so these are things that we can do without blaming people. I do not like the blame game, and I find it makes it just makes people retreat. So thinking about how we can work with the public. And then how can we leverage this tech? So if we're stuck with it, what can we do with it? Can we use WhatsApp or can we use Facebook or YouTube or Twitter or all the places where all the bad stuff is happening to actually get some good stuff out there? So if you remember when I talked about people looking at the comments, well, can we get some good stuff in the comments? And actually, um, Google and other folks are looking into these kinds of things. Well, can we have responses um, to um, the uh, automatic? So if you see something in a comment that like, using AI and other things, could it trigger an automatic correction? Can we do these kinds of things? So can we go to the places where people are and leverage those opportunities? Now, as I've said, I do not put my my money on the tech companies <laughs> to actually do that for us. But if we as people can, can use the technology that we have, can we use our, our platforms to do this work? I think together this presents an opportunity for tweaking or changing that ecosystem. And so when we think about elections as these events, you know, in the United States, <laughs> they go and go and go forever. Most countries aren't like that, right? But so if we kind of think about elections as, as events or as opportunities to understand what happens in a, in, in, a, in a kind of crystallized moment, I think that both then tells us what's going to happen during the everyday. And I think what happens in the everyday is going to tell us what happens in the next 
elections. And so by, by looking in these cracks and by looking globally, I think we're better positioned to understand election uh, misinformation in the United States and around the world. And I, I would hope that that would give us a bit more agency in our own, in our own lives. And that's all I have for you. Now it's time for our question and answer portion. Uh, for those of us in the room, please raise your hand and the microphone will be brought to you. I'll have some questions in a minute. Um, for those of you who are watching online, you can text your questions to 319-600-2588. Again, that is 319-600-2588. Any immediate questions at the moment? I had a question um, about the between times. I like that as a concept and uh, maybe a lived experience. Uh, living here in Iowa, where we might see the presidential caucus season kick off any day now. Um, do you have any tips for helping us um, be in those between times? Yeah, that's a really interesting question, right? Because of course, here we, we have our own um, our own political environment, our own information ecosystem, and I think so. To me, what I think is is really important about um, understanding the everyday or the in between is figuring out what makes sense in a local context, right? What makes sense in Iowa is in, it's not going to make sense if we just even use the United States, or right? it's not going to make sense in California, it's not going to make sense in Massachusetts or wherever. And so, one of the problems with <laughs> with political communication in this country is we actually don't invest a lot in that local context in the way that, that we probably could. So to me, the things that we can do in the in the in between times um, is, and this kind of goes to my whole thoughts and strategies on how to get people to actually consume news and information, quality news and information without just being like, read the New York Times. Okay, well, that's not gonna work for everybody. What I, what I like to think about is find those issues that you do care about. So when people talk about their lived experience and what matters to them, they may not realize they're talking about politics or the economy or whatever it is, but they are. And so if you can figure, or, or climate, right, whatever it might be, none of us have time to consume all the news about all the things. What we do have time to do is consume the news and information about the things we care about. And most people actually care about something. <laughs> and it's not just sports and it's not just entertainment. People do care. And so I think if we spend that time curating a media diet in the between times, a media diet that's healthy, that has a mix of perspectives in it, um, that has a mix of trusted sources and um, actors, both from traditional media, but also you know, non-traditional media and other folks in your life, experts that you know, people that you think are just really good at understanding and digesting, your media environment is going to be vast. And so if you can curate that and develop this media diet around a few things you care about, it's going to help you then translate that to elections when we're being bombarded with policy and wonk talk that most of us don't understand. But if you have a sense, oh yeah, you know, when I, when I care about, I care about water, water quality in Iowa, well, if I'm going to look for environmental coverage or understanding climate in an election context, I'm going to go to those same places and those same people. So I think that's really important for us as, as individuals. But on the other side, I think we should not pretend that political targeting and misinformation isn't happening when it's not front and center the groundwork is laid, right? In, in the Kenyan context, stoking fears around ethnic groups is not a one-off, it's a long game. So what do we see here? Stoking fears around race, stoking fears around all these culture wars, that's the long game. And so if we're able to not let that cloud everything, <laughs> that, that also, that's also helpful. So realizing and thinking about why is this messaging happening right now? What's the point? What's the purpose? And just kind of taking that, um, that approach in the everyday, I think, trains you too. It gets your brain working in those ways. And to me, that's not asking people to spend hours and hours and hours or read every, you know, subscribe to every newspaper, or do whatever. It's just giving people a set of tools and strategies and things that can be scaled up and scaled down. And it's doing it in that way that is um, about stuff they care about. And I think that's going to be our best bet to actually get people to do this kind of work. So we do 
Um, <laughs> we do have a question. It says, are you going to pay for a blue check for your Twitter? No, <laughs> I am not going to pay for a blue check for my Twitter. <laughs> I don't have one now and I don't care. <laughs> um, no, so this is a, you know, a cheeky comment about, about Elon Musk and, and Twitter, you know, changing basically how they're verifying accounts. But it just goes back to my point of would you trust the tech platforms and the people who run them um, with your entire information ecosystem? I wouldn't. And so these kinds of changes, right, they can happen at the discretion of these folks. And so I think we are better off um, having a more diverse uh, approach to how we consume media and really thinking about those things. We should know a little bit about who owns these companies and what they're doing. I don't think you need to know the ins and outs, but having that basic knowledge is helpful because then you know when you're going to the well, how polluted is it? They're all polluted. Well, how polluted? And I think that we're just seeing that Twitter become more and more polluted. So we have another question online. Um, you said something about developing and testing interventions in Kenya, and the person wants to know um, what did an intervention look like? Yeah, so some of the work um, I've done in the United States context was developing and working with some folks here to develop um, news, news literacy messages or corrections to misinformation, and we would test them in experimental con experiments where we would essentially mock up Twitter, these kinds of things, and see, you know, can you actually correct people's uh, misperceptions, things like that. So that was a, a whole area of research that I was working on, and then this um, this contextual work in Kenya and Senegal about understanding misinformation. So we kind of put those two ideas together, and what we did in the, in the Kenya and Senegal context is we took all those interviews, and we figured out the kinds of things people were talking about. What were what were the big um, false claims around vaccines and, and um, COVID and et cetera? It was a COVID study that were circulating. We talked to those journalists and fact checkers. What are you seeing? What are you doing? Oh, give us examples of your best stuff. What what did get clicks? And so we created messages uh, using both the input from the professionals and the users, and we developed a uh, two week long study on WhatsApp where we sent people multiple messages daily. And the messages were either correcting misinformation or encouraging people to do the things I was just saying, look for multiple sources, do this or that. And we um, surveyed them at the beginning, the end, um, and looked at things like vaccine, you know, intention to um, receive the vaccine or improving um, beliefs around, around vaccines. And so we did that um, as a two week study. And then we did a follow up, um, which was a sh was slightly shorter. And that was just, we just did that in Kenya. We just completed that a month or two ago uh, where people were receiving messages, but we did it um, over a five day period instead of a two week period, kind of trying to test these different lengths um, to see the same idea, seeing if we could change uh, perceptions and intentions for, for vaccination. And we did see some movement. So again, these, these changes are small. I don't have the stats in front of me, but statistically significant, but small, um, small changes. And so these are the kinds of messages that we are um, interested in. And one of the, in the, the, the one we just did, we also asked people about their willingness to share this kind of content, because that's the only way it's going to get in front of people, right? Will you share this in your WhatsApp group? Would you do this? And so we're trying to understand how to create information that does resonate with people and that can both counter false claims or give people good quality information, but then that they'll actually read it and share it and do stuff with it. So somebody's writing, they're, they're, they've been trying to have conversations within their family about misinformation and disinformation and they're writing that even when they give the correct information to the family member the person doesn't believe it and mm -hmm. what can they do yeah that's really really hard um and that's one of the biggest problems in you know think about yourself just if someone tells <laughs> if somebody tells you something that is factually true but you have an inve you're invested in the false belief for various reasons your values right your previous experience it doesn't match your your lived experience no one changes their mind by just being given the facts. And so what some of the work that we're, we're trying to do, and I was, I was actually at a presentation yesterday where they were talking about this as well, is how do you lean into the uncertainty or the fear or the, um, the values that people hold? And instead of using that, as we've seen with these bad actors, to stoke more, <laughs> you know, stoke more misinformation, how can we actually use that to get people to start changing their mind a little bit. It's a lot harder 
than just saying, well, actually, it's 15%, and you said it was 8%. It's like, nobody cares. So how do we actually understand where these people are coming from? And so to have those conversations, what we've seen is that it does help to recognize especially if it is something complicated where there may be like COVID vaccines, for example, where there may be competing science or uncertainty, first acknowledging that, acknowledging it's difficult, um, having a conversation with the person as if they have, they're a good faith actor, not a bad actor, and really taking people where they are and then not expecting that you're gonna change them in one conversation. We see this with voting and other things as well, right? This is, this is that long game. So having the conversations, being willing to admit when you're wrong, going back it, it, it going it, it back and forth and taking the time. So it, it does take more work, but we do know that people will update their beliefs. Not everybody, not all the time, but they, it will happen in our work on correction and our work on um, news literacy shows that. You can nudge people, but if you think you're gonna have you know one hour long conversation and you're gonna get an anti-vaxxer to line up and get a vaccine, that's not gonna happen. It's gonna take a lot more work than that, and I think starting to understand why people do these things, where they're coming from, what are their experiences, is gonna help us do that. Simply saying to someone, the data doesn't support that, or no, vaccines are safe and effective, it's not, that's not gonna be the way. And so we have to be willing to kind of take that, take that time. And it's challenging, I, don't get me wrong, nobody likes to have an argument with their family. And so this is why we know this is the kind of work that's gonna take back and forth, and, and as researchers, if we can develop interventions, messages, strategies that are scalable and that we know work, that's something that we can actually contribute to public life. I was wondering, um, as Cambridge Analytica finished its existence as a corporation, are there next generation groups that are doing this kind of work? Are the social media houses doing it in-house or the combination? There are definitely folks, I mean, those guys didn't just go away. <laughs> there are folks absolutely still doing this. Um, you, even with that, the, the, the individual actors involved there, they all went on to do other kinds, of, um, other kinds of work. So, you know, now they might be called consultants or whatever, you know, we've called them that forever. Um, so these kinds of um, folks, particularly in that Kenyan example that I was talking about from the 22 election, where they're funding local actors, those are the same kinds of people. So we, they don't want us to know who they are, right? Because if we know, then the, the, it, it's up, right? So a lot of what, what we're seeing now is movement to um, outsource to these local communities, really figure out how to get into these spaces in a way that it can't be tracked back to you. Um, we saw this, you know, you, I, we won't even know, right, and for a while, what kind of misinformation was circulating in this up for the midterms that was funded by bad actors from pick your country, you know? And so a lot, a lot of that is, is happening and until, and this is where the tech companies come into play. They could help us know <laughs> as researchers and academics, but if they, if they tell us all the bad actors that are operating on their platforms or that are pay to play, what, what happens? Everyone's gonna leave the platform. So they're not incentivized to do that. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much to Dr. Tully for her excellent presentation. Uh, Melissa, I am honored to present you with ICFRC's highly coveted mug for coffee, tea, or the beverage of your choice. Ooh, thank you so Enjoy. much. Enjoy. <laughs> thank you for having yes, me. Yes, <laughs> you're welcome. Um, ICFRC's next program will be with Dr. Carly Nichols. This will be next week. She'll speak about the issue of malnutrition and the power of storytelling among women's groups in Eastern India. We look forward to seeing you there. Thanks for joining us today. We are adjourned. Thank you.